This is Stephanie Huff, and we are continuing with the concept of metabolism. This lecture is going to be on liver disease. So an overview. of liver disease. Um, the liver is a complex organ with multiple metabolic and regulatory functions Um, because there's a significant amount of blood in the liver at all times, it's exposed to the effects of pathogens, drugs, toxins, and possible malignant cells. As a result, it may become inflamed or damaged, or even cancerous tumors may develop. Essential functions of metabolisms of proteins, carbohydrates, and fats occur in the liver. It does um, also metabolize um, things like steroid hormones and most drugs. It detoxifies alcohol and toxic substances. It is vital to digestion and metabolism of nutrients, uh, the production of plasma proteins, including those involved in clotting, and the metabolism and excretions of compounds like bilirubin, steroid hormones and ammonia um, is turned to urea and is expelled through the body through the kidneys. It also helps with the excretions of toxins which would be alcohol and drugs. Impaired function of liver cells has um, multiple effects. Um, impaired protein and glucose um, metabolism, including uh, reduced bile production. There are these special types of cells called Kupfer, K-U-P-F-F-E-R cells, and they will phagocytize foreign cells and damage blood cells, and these are located in the liver. This impaired protein um, is albumin and clotting factors. Um, which puts them at increased risk for bleeding. Decreased albumin um, causes peripheral edema and ascites. Um, impaired glucose metabolism, that can cause hypo or hyperglycemia. The reduced bile production impairs the absorption of lipids and fats. Um, soluble vitamins such as vitamin K, which causes bleeding tendencies if their vitamin K level is low. It does impair steroid hormones um, and this includes estrogen and testosterone. So that leads to feminization in men and irregular menses in women. All right, cirrhosis is the end stage of chronic liver disease. It is progressive, irreversible, and eventually leads to liver failure. Alcoholic cirrhosis is the most common form of cirrhosis in North America. It can also result from chronic hepatic, or excuse me, chronic hepatitis B or C, prolonged obstruction of the biliary system, long-term severe right-sided heart failure. Looking at pathophysiology and etiology, Functional liver tissue is gradually destroyed, excuse me, destroyed and replaced by fibrous scar tissue. As hepatocytes and liver lobules are destroyed, the metabolic functions of the liver are lost. Structurally abnormal nodules encircled by connective tissue will form. This fibrous connective tissue forms um, constrictive bands that disrupt blood and bile flow within the liver lobules. This restricted flow will lead to portal hypertension, so blood no longer flows freely, freely through the liver to the inferior vena cava. Looking at your etiology, alcoholic cirrhosis is the end result of alcoholic liver disease. The alcohol 
causes metabolic changes in the liver. They will have triglyceride and fatty acids increase, causes a fatty liver. If alcohol is stopped, the liver can heal. If not, um, alcoholic cirrhosis develops, causing necrosis, fibrosis, and destruction of the liver. Biliary, um, we'll go back to alcoholic cirrhosis one more time. Uh, development will depend on the total amount of alcohol consumed, the number of years that they have consumed excessive alcohol, uh, consumed um, and blood alcohol levels. Um, women develop cirrhosis at lower, lower overall levels of alcohol use than men. Um, malnutrition often accompany, accompanies alcoholic cirrhosis as well. Biliary cirrhosis is when bile flow um, is obstructed within the liver or in the biliary system. They retained bile damages and destroys liver cells that leads to inflammation, fibrosis, um, and uh, destruction of the nodules in the liver. Post-hepatic cirrhosis. This can um, result from chronic hepatitis B or C or from an unknown cause, the liver is shrunken um, in these individuals and they will have um, nodular formations with fibrosis um, and this ex uh, causes extensive loss of those liver cells. Risk factors um, include high risk behaviors, alcohol use and injection drug use which increases their risk for hepatitis B, C, and D. So this is just showing you the difference between a healthy liver and a liver with cirrhosis. So manifestations in your early stages, uh, the liver is enlarged and may be tender. They may have a dull aching pain in the right upper quadrant. They may experience weight loss, weakness, anorexia, diarrhea, or constipation. As the disease progresses, Manifestations related to liver cell failure and portal hypertension develop. This causes an impaired metabolism, uh, which causes bleeding, ascites, gynecomastia in men, and infertility in women, jaundice and neurologic changes, portal hypertension um, causes ascites, peripheral edema, anemia, decreased white blood cells, as well as decrease in platelet counts. Treatment is supportive and directed at slowing the progression of liver failure and reducing complications. Um, treatment medications to help regulate protein mal uh, metabolism, maintain fluid and electrolyte balance and supportive therapies. Uh, they try to treat malnutrition, anemia, bleeding tendencies, encephalopathy, uh, renal failure, and infections. All right, and so this is just showing you some of the um, ascites and different other manifestations that you may see um, in liver disease. And we'll go through these as well. But that um, atherosclerosis is basically also called a liver flap and we'll um, be talking about that but that's just kind of what the um, fingers do. All right and so this is um, also just kind of showing you a um, slide that has the different uh, manifestations according to the body system that is affected. And so you can see the spider angioma, which we saw in the slide before on the skin. It's just like a big spider web, that red thing, and then the palmar erythema, the redness of the palms, is what we saw on that slide before also. All right, so portal hypertension causes the blood to be rerouted to adjoining vessels, um, which is known as collateral vessels. And that is because um, 
the affected veins will become engorged and congested. So, and these will occur in the esophagus, rectum, and the abdomen. All right, they will have splenomegaly, and that's because with the um, portal hypertension, it causes blood to be shunted into the um, spleen, um, the splenic vein, and this will enlarge the spleen itself. Uh, they will have greater destruction in red blood cells, which causes anemia, destruction in their white blood cells, known as leukopenia, which is low white blood cell count, um, and they will have increased rate of platelets, uh, known as thrombocytopenia. All right, um, ascites is the accumulation of plasma-rich fluid in the abdominal cavity, hypoalbuminemia, and hyperaldosteronism um, occurs. The hypoalbuminemia causes fluid to escape into the extravascular compartments. Hyperaldosteronism causes sodium and water retention, contributing to ascites and generalized edema. So this is looking at your um, portal hypertension and just in a little bit detail, more detail um, than what it has in your book. And so basically just kind of showing you your treatment with propanolol, which is enderol. It's a beta blocker um, to help decrease that portal venous pressure and decrease the esophageal varices and bleeding. Um, Sandistatin and um, patrician is also used to help with bleeding varices as well. Alright, and so this is showing you these varices that can occur um, that you can see in the stomach, in the portal vein, um, and then you can also see them in the abdominal wall itself. All right, so your complication of ascites, and that is just that accumulation of serous fluid in the peritoneal or abdominal cavity, and that's from that decreased albumin and portal hypertension, and then you can see your um, signs and symptoms as well as treatment with sodium restriction, diuretics, um, aldactone is used, um, paracentesis can be used to remove the fluid, and this is showing you a paracentesis and how they're removing the fluid, um, and a lot of times this is used for um, comfort measures to help decrease some of that um, pressure in the intra-abdominal cavity. It also helps with them breathing because um, it takes that pressure off the diaphragm. All right, esophageal varices is another um, thing that can develop, and these are enlarged, thin, walled veins that form in the submucosa of the esophagus. It is caused from portal hypertension. Um, they may rupture and cause massive hemorrhage. Even eating high roughage foods can precipitate the bleeding. Uh, thrombocytopenia, platelet deficiency um, is just what thrombocytopenia is. Um, and impaired production of clotting factors by the liver contribute to the risk for hemorrhage as well. Portal systemic encephalopathy is also called hepatic encephalopathy. This results from cerebral edema and accumulation of toxics in the blood. With hepatic encephalopathy, you will see asterexis, which is what we saw in that picture. It's also known as a liver fat. Um, it is a muscle tremor that interferes with the ability to maintain a fixed position of the extremities and causes involuntary jerky movements. And so in order to do this test, you ask the patient to extend their arms and dorsiflect the wrist. Um, if atorexis is present, this causes a downward flapping of the hands. This is mostly found in the upper extremities. Also changes in personality and mentation can also develop. They may have anywhere from agitation to restlessness, impaired judgment, and slurred speech. These are early findings. Um, this will progress to confusion, disorientation, and incoherence. 
They can also have cerebral edema and hypoxia that leads um, and is a leading cause of death. All right, and so this is just further looking at um, esophageal varices, um, looking at the treatment, which we'll talk about this balloon tamponade with um, Sigstakin Blake Moore tube um, as far as the treatment, um, decreasing their risk factors, which are ETOH, aspirin use, spicy foods, and rough foods, um, fresh frozen plasma, photonics, lactulose, um, Zephaxin um, can be given to prevent hepatic encephalopathy from breakdown of blood and release of ammonia. All right, and so this is looking at um, esophageal varices. And this is that um, Stockman Blakemore tube, and you can see it's got two balloons, one that goes in the stomach and one that goes in the esophagus, and then some traction is applied. Um, and like I said, we'll talk about this a little bit more, but I just wanted y'all to see a picture so you'll kind of understand what we're talking about when we get to that point. All right, hepatic encephalopathy. Um, and this is basically where the ammonia is not cleared by the liver, where it usually breaks it down into urea and it's excreted into the kidneys. And this does not happen. Um, so they will have neurologic and mental changes. Um, this impaired consciousness, um, the atorectasis, which is those flapping tremors, um, fetter hepaticus, which is um, an odor that they will have um, in their breath that indicates this high ammonia levels. So treatment is to reduce the ammonia levels. Um, and so lactulose is one of the main things that's given to decrease those ammonia levels. Um, but lactulose is a laxative, so it um, does help with um, constipation. Um, sometimes they'll need antibiotics as well. Um, this rifaximin um, is the drug of choice for antibiotic use. All right, and then this is looking at your portal systemic encephalopathy um, caused by increased um, blood ammonia. Um, the other problems that can be associated with it, um, treatment, and signs and symptoms. All right, and this again is showing you that liver um, flap or the atorectasis, um, and then the confusion, and then up at the top, it just kind of grades it according to how bad the um, hepatic encephalopathy can be. All right, looking at the hepatorenal syndrome. This is um, advanced cirrhosis um, in ascites. They will have renal failure with azotemia, which is excessive nitrogenous waste and products in the blood, sodium retention, oliguria, and hypotension. This is a result of an imbalanced blood flow, results in vessel constriction leading to and within the kidneys. They can have spontaneous bacterial peritonitis which um, is an inflammatory um, response to peritonitis. It is worsen, um, worsens the ascites by increasing the permeability of the capillaries in the mesentery um, section of the GI tract. Manifestations um, may be subtle with an increased um, abdominal pain, fever, increased ascites, worsening encephalopathy and overall decline in their condition. The um, hepatorenal uh, syndrome can also be precipitated by GI bleeding, aggressive diuretic therapy, or an unknown cause. All right, collaboration, a holistic approach is needed that addresses the physiologic needs, psychosocial needs, and spiritual needs of your client. Nurse coordinates the care among the providers. It is important to include the family in their plan of care, especially if alcoholic um, cirrhosis is identified um, with this alcohol abuse so that the family um, is aware of the issues. All right, so diagnostic test, um, liver function test, all are gonna be increased in cirrhosis. Um, they will get a CBC with platelets. They're looking, um, normally they'll have a decrease in H&H. &H. Uh, red blood cell count, this leads to anemia. 
um, and this is related to bone marrow suppression, increased red blood cell destruction, bleeding and deficiencies in folic acid and vitamin B12, decreased platelets related to destruction by the spleen, leukopenia, which is your decreased white blood cell count, and that's related to the splenomegaly. Looking at uh, coagulation times, they will have a prolonged thrombin time, serum electrolytes, um, lack of vitamin um, K, bilirubin, um, increase with severe cirrhosis, both direct and indirect bilirubin, Serum albumin is usually decreased from impaired liver production. Serum ammonia is um, increased um, because the liver fails to convert it to urea for renal excretion. Serum glucose and cholesterol are often abnormal. Abdominal ultrasound is used to evaluate uh, liver size, ascites, and identify liver nodules. Um, your esophagoscopy is an upper endoscopy to look um, for the esophageal varices. Liver biopsy is not always needed to diagnose, but may be done to distinguish cirrhosis from other forms of liver disease. Looking back at your serum electrolytes, um, they may have low sodium, so hyponatremia is common, um, and that's usually from hemodilution. Hypokalemia, hypophosphatemia, Hypomagnesemia are usually related to malnutrition and altered renal excretion of those electrolytes. Pharmacologic therapy. Medications are used to treat complications and the effects of cirrhosis. They will not reverse or slow the process itself. Known hepato, uh, hepatotoxic drugs and alcohol are avoided as these drugs are metabolized by the liver. Um, this will include your barbiturates, sedatives, hypnotics, acetaminophen, diuretics, reduce fluid retention and ascites. Your spironolactone, also known as aldactone, is the drug of choice because it addresses the increased aldosterone levels. It is the number one, um, and that is the number one cause of ascites. If additional diuresis is needed, they will add a loop diuretic like furosemide or Lasix. Um, and they will add that to the regimen. All right, lactulose um, and neomycin are used to help reduce the nitrogen load and lower the serum ammonia levels. Um, these are added when hepatic encephalopathy develops. Um, if you've ever seen anybody with hepatic encephalopathy, they come in and a lot of times they may not even be arousable at all or sort of in a comatose state. Um, and lactulose works really well. Uh, we had took care of a patient in the ER that had this um, and had a group of students. And then the next day I was on progressive and the guy was awake and alert, oriented and talking. Um, and he had just been on the lactulose for like 24 hours. So it was already lowering those ammonia levels enough to change his level of consciousness. All right, other meds, um, your beta blockers, your uh, naldolol, which is also cor uh, Corgard, um, can be added to isosorbide monotrate, which is Ismo, Emdur, or Monocat. These are used to prevent rebleeding of esophageal varices. It also lowers the hepatic venous um, pressures. Ferrous sulfate and folic acid are used to treat anemia. Vitamin K may be given to decrease the risk of bleeding. When bleeding is acute, packed red blood cells, fresh frozen plasma, or platelets are given to restore blood components and promote homeostasis. And acids are, are prescribed as indicated. Asoxapam or Cerax, this is a benzodiazepine, um, anti-anxiety, uh, sedative uh, type medication used to treat acute agitation. Um, this medication is not metabolized in the liver, so it is safe for them to use. Looking at nutritional therapy, dietary support is going to be essential in caring for patients with cirrhosis. Sodium intake is restricted to less than 2 grams a day. 
fluid restrictions are included to decrease ascites and edema. Um, fluids are usually limited to about 1,500 milliliters per day. Um, protein um, are restricted or eliminated only when the ammonia levels are high. So unless the serum ammonia levels are high, diet with adequate calories and protein is recommended. Most with mild chronic encephalopathy can tolerate 60 to 80 grams of protein a day. Protein restrictions are rarely justified because they're already in a state of malnutrition. Plant protein is preferred over animal protein though. Uh, parental nutrition um, can be used um, to help maintain nutritional status when food intake is limited. Their diet should be high in calories, moderate fat intake to promote healing. Vitamin mineral supplements are ordered based on lab values. Uh, deficiency in B-complex vitamins, particularly thiamine, folate, and B12, and in fat-soluble vitamins such as vitamin A, D, and E are common. Patients with alcohol-induced cirrhosis are at risk for magnesium deficiencies and needs replacement of the magnesium as well. Surgery. Liver transplants are indicated for some with irreversible progressive cirrhosis, um, those with functional decline, increased bilirubin levels, decreasing albumin levels, um, increasing problems with complications that um, poorly respond to treatment. Contraindications for surgery would be if a malignancy is there, if they have active alcohol or drug abuse, um, they're not going to do any kind of transplant because they're just going to destroy their new liver. Or if they're a poor surgical, uh, have poor surgical risk. So basically they won't survive um, being put to sleep. Nursing process. It's aimed at reducing further liver damage, teaching client to make healthier lifestyle choices, and minimizing symptoms of the disease. Assessment. You want to get a good health history. Things that you're going to um, be asking about are abdominal distension, looking um, at jaundice, paritis, which is the itching, history, or excuse me, alterations in libido um, or impotence, duration of their symptoms, history of liver or gallbladder disease. You're also going to be asking about current medications um, that they're on, um, any of their current manifestations that they may have, including abdominal pain and discomfort, any recent weight loss, weakness, anorexia, altered bowel, bowel elimination, um, excessive bleeding or bruising, um, the pattern and extent of alcohol and injection uh, drug use, um, any other prescription medication or non-prescription medications that they're on. Physical assessment is going to include vital signs, their mental status, color and condition of their skin and mucous membranes, peripheral pulses, any edema present, their abdominal assessment, you're looking at the appearance, shape, and contour of the abdomen, assessing their bowel sounds, measuring their abdominal girth, percussing their liver for the liver borders, and palpation, palpating the liver for tenderness and size. Diagnosis, these are your NANDA diagnosis for liver disease. All right, planning goals may include that the client will maintain proper hydration levels as indicated by urine-specific gravity, appropriate diet, and vital signs that are within normal limits. The client will report regular bowel elimination. They will be oriented to person, place, and time, and also avoid alcohol. All right, implementation. You want to stress the relationship between alcohol, drug abuse, and the disease. Balance fluid volume, 
You want to weigh the patient daily, assess for jugular vein distension, measure their abdominal girth daily, check peripheral edema, um, monitor their intake and output. You want to assess their urine specific gravity. This measures the concentration of urine um, and indicates um, their hydration status. Provide low sodium diet. A lot of times they will um, anywhere from 500 to 2,000 milligrams a day. Excessive sodium causes water retention. Sodium follows um, water. Restrict fluids as ordered. Monitor for signs of impaired renal function like oliguria. A um, spe fixed specific gravity of approximately 1.012. Central edema, which is around the eyes and face, increased BUN and creatinine levels. Maintaining mental status. You want to assess their level of consciousness and mental status. You're watching for signs of early encephalopathy, like the atorectasis, changes in their um, handwriting and speech. Avoid um, factors that may precipitate hepatic encephalopathy. And this could be um, hepatotoxic medications and drugs that um, depress the central nervous system. Plan for consistent nursing assignments. This can help determine subtle changes. So you want the same nurses taking care of these patients um, every day. Provide low protein diet. Teach the family importance of diet restrictions. Administer medications or enemas to help decrease the nitrogenous byproducts. So you want to make sure that you're monitoring their bowel functions and provide measures to promote regular elimination and prevent constipation. Keep the patient oriented to person, place, and time. So this may be a constant um, thing that you have to do at first. Minimizing bleeding, you want to monitor their vital signs, report tachycardia and hypotension. These can be signs of hypovolemia. Um, institute bleeding precautions to help decrease the risk of active bleeding. Um, so some of the things that you may want to do is make sure that they're using soft toothbrushes, using electric razors and not straight razors. You want to monitor coagulation studies and platelet counts. Monitor the client who has um, bleeding esophageal varices. Um, Rebleeding re is common, especially within the first week. So you want to um, be watching them for evidence of rebleeding, such as hemoptoemesis, which is vomiting blood, hematochesia, which is bright red blood in the stools, tarry stools, um, and then signs of hypovolemic shock. Maintaining skin integrity is going to be important. Um, severe jaundice with bile salts deposits on the skin causes puritis, um, and then scratching will damage the skin and impair their skin integrity. Um, malnutrition, especially um, protein deficiencies, and edema also increases the risk of breakdown. So making sure that you use warm water rather than hot, because hot increases their pruritus, which is the itching. Use measures to prevent dry skin, apply emollients or lubricants. You want to avoid alcohol-based um, soaps and lotions. If indicated, apply mittens to their hands. This will help prevent scratching. Um, institute measures to prevent skin breakdown, such as turning them every two hours, using alternating pressure mattresses, um, frequently assessing their skin. You also want to um, administer the prescribed antihistamines to help relieve the puritis. Promote balanced nutrition. You want to weigh the patient daily um, in the hospital and at least weekly at home. Provide small meals with snacks, maintaining adequate calories and nutrient intakes. Promote protein and nutrient 
um, intake unless um, protein is restricted. Um, those small meals and snacks are important as well. Um, sometimes they may need supplements like Ensure to make sure they get enough um, nutrient intakes. Um, arranging consultation with a dietitian for diet planning while in the hospital and when they go home. They can provide detailed instructions and sample menus. Managing their complications. Um, paracentesis is the aspiration of fluid from that peritoneal cavity, which helps with the ascites. Um, it can be diagnostic or just a therapeutic measure to help relieve that uh, severe ascites that doesn't respond to diuretic therapy. Um, goal is going to be to relieve respiratory distress from that excessive fluid that is in the abdominal cavity that's pressing on the diaphragm. Bleeding esophageal varices um, can be life-threatening. Um, so you want to restore hemodynamic stability. It's going to be your first priority. They can insert a central line um, so that they can monitor their central venous pressure and pulmonary artery pressures. Um, if they do have active bleeding, they will um, give them blood to restore blood volume and fresh, fresh frozen plasma to restore clotting factors. Somatostatin or atriotide can be given IV um, and it will constrict the blood vessels in the gut so it reduces blood flow in the portal venous system. Vasopressin um, produces generalized vasoconstriction and may also be used. Once their um, blood pressure um, is stable, they can do an upper endoscopy to evaluate and treat the varices. Um, a large nasogastric tube will be inserted um, before the um, endoscopy and gastric lavage would be done to help improve visualization during the endoscopy. During the endoscopy, varices can be banded, which is small rubber bands are put on the varices to occlude the blood flow um, to these areas. They can also be sclerosed. Um, endoscopic sclerosis is injecting um, sclerosing agents into the varices to induce inflammation and clotting. And both of these uh, measures will help decrease the risk of rebleeding. Balloon tamponade, if bleeding is uncontrollable, which is that multi lumen nasogastric tube, and that's that um, Singo Steak and Blakemore uh, tube that I showed you earlier. They also have a Minnesota tube that can be inserted as well. They both have gastric and esophageal balloons that are inflated um, to apply direct pressure to the varices. Um, and then tension is applied as well, um, which also helps to control that bleeding. Um, but there are a risk for balloon tamponade, um, aspiration in the airway, obstruction, uh, tissue ischemia and necrosis due to the pressure of the balloons itself. And endotracheal tube is usually inserted um, before the NG tube to support their airway and decrease the risk of aspiration. All right, so managing complications continued. We're still talking about um, bleeding esophageal varices. Um, also want to relieve portal hypertension. Um, you want to try to relieve it and complications of the esophageal uh, varices and ascites. A transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt or tips is an expandable metal stent to allow blood flow directly from the portal vein into the hepatic vein, and so this bypasses the cirrhotic liver. This relieves pressure in the esophageal varices and allows better control of fluid um, retention with diuretic therapy. It is used short term until a liver transplant can be done. Evaluation. 
you want to monitor lab data. This is going to include your liver function test, CBC with H&H, &H, coagulation studies, electrolytes, serum albumin, and serum ammonia levels. Value should improve if the therapy is successful. Your biophysical data expectations are improvement in vital signs, level of consciousness, appetite, and mobility, absence of bruising and bleeding, adequate urinary and bowel elimination, decreasing ascites, um, and that will be through decreased abdominal girth measurements, restorative uh, sleep, and decreased comfort. And so that is the end of liver disease, um, specifically cirrhosis. If you have questions, let me know, and we'll have to clarify things.